everybody. Welcome to RDA Tech Q&A. You have questions. We have guesses. Um, and I have shit on my monitor. Yay. It is, uh, once again, myself. I'm Nash. I do RDA. I have well over a decade of tech experience, along with my producer, Mike, here. Also does a whole bunch of tech shit. We're going to be looking at the news this week and also taking your questions. <clears throat> If you have questions for RDA Tech Q&A, you can send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. Put Tech Q&A in the subject line. We'll see if maybe we can help you with your various technological foibles. And speaking of technological foibles, oh man, this first story we're discussing is kind of an oopsie. Yeah. Um, but it's also, th this... Um, Windows 10 with uh, with Microsoft Windows 10, they switched from the optional updates, you know, when you used to be able to say, oh, I don't want to install updates, whatnot, to, for home users anyway, mandatory updates. Yeah. And and they bundled them all together. Yeah. So it's so if you, can't, you got a case where you go, well, I really don't want this one. I never do this. You could just uncheck that box, tell it to ignore it. Can't do that and, now. And be good anymore. And now you, you get everything all in one package. Now, for a lot of things, having security updates on all those things as mandatory makes sense. However, yes. that comes with the proviso that the people making the updates have thoroughly tested and vetted said updates before setting them loose on your computer. Now, it's bad enough when a company like Adobe does this. They, they had a problem with this with... Uh, Adobe Premiere a while back. That's bad enough. But when it's your operating system, one of the fundamentals of actually getting shit done becomes a bigger problem. And uh, this happened... Now, I want to stress this also happened with the uh, Windows Insider program, which is people get the updates first, and they, you know... Which, they call it the Insider program. What they really should call it is... The, the beta schmucks who are alpha testing this. Yeah, the alpha testing program, because what happened is uh, Windows 10 anniversary update breaks most webcams. And uh, it's, 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 it's interesting the way this works, because most webcams these days are, are USB based. Yeah. And so what happens is, you know, if you've got a really old webcam, it may not be compressing the data because the USB bandwidth is wide enough to handle the camera data. But if you've got a newer web camera, uh, like the one I have, which does 1080p, I don't know that I have it set for 1080p right now, but yeah. it could, um, has to compress it because USB, USB 2 can't handle 1080p. Where are all it's them USB 3.0 webcams we were supposed to be getting? You seen any of those out there in the wild? No, not yet. So what happens is the, the camera compresses the video. And it passes it to Windows, and which passes it to whatever else is going to be using it. And it gets uncompressed when it's there. And this is fine. And this is how everything worked. Well, yeah. they updated the, uh, the, the frame handler, effectively, is what it is. Uh, and it's, the frame handler now only handles uncompressed data. This is not what I would call an update. Yeah, part of what I think part of why they did it was it involved MPEG and other codecs that were proprietary. And, H.264. Yeah, H.264 and MPEG, which are you have to pay, you have to license those. So what happened was and Microsoft said, hey, we could make a buck here. And just stop using this and then we won't have to pay the license fees anymore. Uh, those, well, that's possible. The article reads more like it was hard. It was it was hard technically, and they didn't want to do it. And now that everyone started complaining, they're going, okay, we'll do it. And they're going to do the MPEG one first because MPEG is easier than H.264. It's hard. We don't want it. It's, 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 it's hard. Oh, man. And the, the, way this, the way this really works, because we're using it on Skype, and one of the things Skype does, which is kind of useful, is when we have you have a video connection going on, it will say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to start at a lower resolution, and then if there's bandwidth, I'm going to upgrade to higher resolution, 
and then higher resolution until it goes to the resolution you've got set to the max. You know, right. whatever your whatever your max setting is. Uh, that way, in case it if it tries to go the highest, the person can't get through. You're sitting there going, "Oh, something's going wrong." You're hitting equipment. You, but if it goes, well, don't don't tell me I'm wrong. You know, you know it's true. People who don't know computers, they start hitting. <laughs> People who know computers hit things too, but we know where to hit them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and so what happens is that when it starts at the low compression, actually at the lower lower settings, lower radio settings, it's not compressed because it's just at the area where it doesn't have to compress anything, and so it handles it fine. And then it goes, okay, I can upgrade to the higher, you know, up step up to a higher higher uh, a video setting. And then it goes to compress them, and your Skype call freezes. And everyone is blaming Skype, but which is also owned by Microsoft. But the Skype programming team is not the same as the OS programming yeah. team, and so the Skype guys are going, "We didn't, we didn't break anything." No, on top, another problem with this is uh, if you're doing like I'm doing right now, streaming. Now I don't use a webcam for this. I actually have a uh, camcorder set to um capture hdmi so i have a 1080p video um so it's a little bit better than a web i don't know i haven't done compression i haven't done a check in a while but regardless it wouldn't affect that because that's a whole different piece of hardware but for most web streamers everybody on twitch who's got a really nice usb webcam if yeah. they now, were on Windows 10 in the Insider program, they were fucked. Or, got, or, or downloaded the anniversary edition already. Yeah. Um, there is a fix at the end of the article. It has the standard disclaimer of don't do this unless you know what you're doing with registry settings. Which most people won't. Yeah. But it's our, well, ours Technica tends to be more the technically savvy people, which is where we're looking at this article. So ours readers are going to know they can do this. You and I know we could do this. Your average game streamer, maybe not. This is starting. This is highlighting the problem with Microsoft's update cycle. Is on the one hand, they want everyone updated to the most current version to have all the security fixes and all the latest stuff, and also because sometimes Microsoft slips in some stuff that they don't want to tell you about. Like the fucking pop up for Windows 10 in the first place, or telemetry telemetry settings. Yeah, they they Microsoft wants control of the updates for a variety of reasons, and okay, fine, but the onus is on them to make sure they get this shit right. Yeah, because while this just affects a webcam kind of thing, eventually this is going to be. It, 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 unless they clean up how they handle these updates, eventually this might hit something critical, like, say, a slightly older model processor or, say, a specific video card or a certain kind of hardware or maybe even just the way Windows interacts with uh, Chrome, for example, something everybody uses, and they might overlook it. And it could cause. I, oh, I know. I, I think in the case of Chrome, they wouldn't be overlooking that they'd be doing it on purpose. Well, but it could cause anywhere from a small hiccup to a mat to data loss to damage to file systems to it, it could get really bad. This it this I am a I'm pretty much I do not like ceding control of my update cycle to Microsoft. Especially with the newer versions, with Windows 8 and Windows 10, the way it will, we're shutting your computer down in five minutes to update shit. You better go ahead and save. Don't care what you're doing. We're shutting that the fuck down. Yeah, at least my work computer is polite enough to go, hey, we've applied some settings that require a reboot. Rebooting in 30 minutes. And there's a little button that you can click up to five times to give yourself additional 30-minute well, locks. Even still, that's fuck. Th that, that is... I hate well, that. If, if, if I have three hours, though, to, to go, oh, I need to do, do a reboot in the next three hours, I can plan that. I personally did a bunch of registry hacks when I put Windows 8 on my machine. I haven't put on Windows 10 yet. I'm still leery about it. But when I put Windows 8 on my machine, I hacked the registry back and forth to make sure it can't do that anymore. Mm. Which, again, is possible, but most people won't know how to do that. Yeah. 
I had to hack the registry to get Windows 10 to recognize my DVD burner. So, yeah. The, the, I, I say hack the registry. I put in one setting of value of one. But. This, this, these are some growing pains, especially for, since uh, we, Microsoft, Microsoft is new to doing this. Apple has done this kind of thing for a long time. Yeah. But the difference with Apple is Apple's hardware across the board is completely standardized. Well, there's another difference, too. Hmm. A Apple fans are used to being told by Apple, bend over, here's an update. Yes, but also all the, all the Macintoshes are provided by Apple. They, they have standard models they can test every update on right there in their office. Yeah. The, the only thing that they, were, they would theoretically have to worry about is some third-party peripherals, and they're generally not concerned. Right, yeah. That's, uh... Okay. You didn't um, buy your Apple cam? Uh, we're sorry we don't support that. But it, this does indicate that there are going to be some growing pains with this for Microsoft. And Microsoft is, especially when it comes to critical systems, business systems, Microsoft is going to have to... Grady, not now. He's playing with his toys. Microsoft is going to have to make some changes in this process and make it a little more bulletproof. Um... All right, before we go in the next story real quick, are, are you still using the other mic or do you have your good one turned back on? Um, I don't know. Let me look. Yeah, let's check that real quick. I think it should be the good mic. Yeah, it's the good mic. Okay, good. It is a little crackly, but not, not nearly as bad as it was before. Okay. Well, there's still one component I could replace. What, is that you? Hmm? Is that you? I said there's still one component I could replace. I'm here. saying, is that you? No. Oh, okay. What component then? Uh, it's the it's the uh, mixer. Uh, I wouldn't think it'd be in the line for what you're getting, but who knows? Uh, eh. All right. Well, um, moving right along. So for a long time, currently, we've talked about this a lot. Intel is dominating. The uh, the the uh, CPU computer processor market, at least in terms of desktops, servers, yeah. even laptops, Intel owns the roost. Now AMD is supposed to be their competition, and they've been blowing it for years. See, they're they're blowing it. Hey, I'm timing. I'd say it's right on schedule, but I've not been able to figure out the train schedule here. I've lived here for over a decade, and it just seems random. It Well, in any event, um, AMD... Because we don't have that every week. <laughs> that was awful. Yes, it was. Um, AMD has been uh, kind of dropping the ball, as it were. Ever since the Phenom 2... Uh, which was probably the last good processor that AMD put out. Their competitiveness has completely evaporated. It used to be the choice between Intel and AMD was Intel had really good stuff at ridiculous prices. And AMD had almost as good stuff for much, much cheaper. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, you know, the only people who would then buy Intel would be the ones, I want that little bit more. And I'm willing to pay for it. Yeah, which, which there are plenty of people who would do that. Or and but AMD found a really big home in the enthusiast community because we also AMD also said you want to overclock this fucker, have fun, knock yourself out, do whatever you want. Which Intel really fought against for a long yeah. time. Oh yeah, they locked down their chips to the greatest extent. <clears throat> you have to buy the special overclocking edition of the chip to overclock. Which they still do. They still do that. Oh yeah. Um. But after the Phenom 2 and with the bulldozer architecture and then the pile driver architecture, the, ins the, the choice was instead of real good, super expensive and sort of okay, not as expensive, it turned to real good, super expensive to this barely fucking works, also kind of expensive. And the but price to performance ratio was oh, yeah. thrown off. 
but now they've got something new. Now they claim, they claim. AMD has finally unveiled the Zen CPU. Uh, Zen is AMD's next architecture for their CPUs. And what they're claiming is they're going to be on a par, not just with, with Intel's uh, regular desktop processors, but on a par with Intel's enthusiast processors. Those are the ones that have uh, uh, six cores, eight cores, 10 cores, 12 cores. The almost server PCs, the ones you put in home workstations, and, and they're claiming they're going to be able to compete in that same arena. Now, Intel is uh, going to release their next generation core this fall, so we'll see. If but, but here's the thing about that. Intel's has kind of plateaued in terms True. of performance. Because they haven't had comp they've, they've, they've had no reason right. to compete. I am personally using an Intel processor from two generations ago because... It's still fine. It's still... it's My processor is only a little bit slower, maybe 10% slower than the brand new one that came out this year. Yeah. And I got my, my processor from 2013. So there's no point in upgrading. There, there's no no reason for it. Now, however, um, now AMD did a demonstration of their new processor against um, the 8-core uh, uh, Intel 6900K, which is a $1,000, it's a $1,100 processor. And it managed to beat out uh, Intel's processor in this demonstration. Now, was it tweaked to, to give them an advantage? It was AMD running the benchmark, so we don't yeah, know. Yeah. But they'll, they'll be, once they once they get released to the market, there'll be some third party reviews, uh, and we'll see. You know, we'll see Tom's hardware. We'll see all all the names come out review this thing. We'll get some real numbers, and if it stands up even close to that, I think they're they're going to have a winner there. But even better. Assuming the price isn't outrageous. Well, if it stands up close to that and they say, eh, we're releasing this processor that competes with Intel's $1,100 processor for $500. They could probably even go $800. And... Well, yeah, they could. But if they went to $500, if they could afford to go to $500, they, they, they dump. It's, it's the same. Uh, they slaughter. Yeah, it's the same uh, mentality that they came out when they upgraded their video cards recently with the RX 480. The $200 market to be able to compete at 1440p video, whereas NVIDIA's option was around $300 and still is around $300. They are going to claim a lot of market share there. Yeah. And with CPUs, because what, what do you want? He, do you see him up here jumping up, mugging for the camera? Little bastard. Um, because Intel has such a dominance on the market and everyone is forced to go to them, if AMD, if AMD offers a reliable and solid competitor at a much... I'd say what? If, if, if you were... 750. I'd say 750. That, $750. They would... They would take a good chunk of the market. Yeah. Uh, anyone looking to build an, a new computer where they're going to, I don't have a huge amount of money, but I want something good. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's, I would be tempted. Well, and, to and, and haven't they already locked down a lot of the uh, game station? Contracts? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, they currently, they produce, well, they were producing for Nintendo, Nintendo, uh, not anymore, but they, uh, they're producing the, the chips in the, PS4, PS4.5, Xbone, Xbone Slim, Xbone Scorpio. They're make they on both sides, Sony and Microsoft. They're making all of the consoles. Yeah, and if, and if this new chip is a basically a drop-in replacement, that would you know be a, a mid-cycle tech refresh for all those platforms. Well, another thing they're also looking for here, the market they really have their eye on is the server market. Because that's that is is a gold find right there. And if yeah, the problem there is you're going to have a lot of you're going to have a lot of management types who go, "Oh, we want Intel." They know the name. They they and you know 
happens. And some of the uh, computer engineers are going to go, uh, no, we we have we haven't we need to see more on this chip stability before we we recommend it. True, but you could say some managers will go, we want Intel, but some managers will just say we want Dell. This is true. And if Dell offers AMD at a competing price, and they can sell them, they will. Yeah. Uh, the first laptops for these are going to be out. It looks like. Uh... Oh, it doesn't say. 2017. Uh, oh, that, second that, half of the year. Second yeah, half that's of the, the year. other bit of the news here. While they are showing good numbers, and while it did increase AMD stock price with this demonstration really nicely, the other quieter news from this press conference was uh, the release schedule on the new chips has slipped. They were projecting quarter four of 2016. Now they're projecting early 2017, which could be quarter one or quarter two. Um, still, still pretty good. I mean, a lot of things slip schedules. Slip schedule. Look, look at No Man's Sky. <laughs> oh, yeah, that worked out so great. That that was fantastic, the extra months we waited for that. Um, the, the main I may have triggered a rant. Now, the main concern here is when Bulldozer came out, we were also getting all of these promises and these numbers and these these claims from AMD. And when, that they didn't live up to. And pile driver, AMD said, no, we fixed it now. And I don't recall that they had. And now we have Zed, and they're also saying, no, really, we fixed it now. That, that's why I'm waiting. I'm going to wait for the Tom's hardware and the like for yeah. reviews. Yeah, because while while this does look very good, they're moving to DDR4, they're having a new socket type. Another thing to keep in mind here is AMD also has to worry about the chipset, which a lot of people don't aren't, aren't really concerned with. But the chipset is just is not as important as the processor, but it does make a difference. The chipset is the little piece on the motherboard that allows everything to talk to everything else properly. And if AMD releases this super new processor, but the chipset is lackluster, then that means it doesn't matter how fast the processor is, it's not going to be able to talk to everything yeah. properly. The, the processor will be sitting there idle a significant portion of the time because everything else is bottleneck. And Intel has a very mature chipset at this point, so yeah. they they're doing okay there yeah but in any event this this is promising this this is very promising and I, even if i'm not going to upgrade anytime soon i would love for this to happen because what it will mean is prices will come down across the board and that's good for everybody that's what competition does that's a good thing we have one more this week about some new hardware, but it's a it's a different kind of new hardware, and this fascinated me. Um, because while we have had implants for the brain before, I don't ever recall one like this getting involved in memory. Um, there's a new startup that uh, is work. It's called. Um, kernel and they have designed a brain implant that could potentially help people who have issues with long-term memory storage neat this actually ties into a story i've been trying to write for a while but um it, it's very neat uh it's my my reluctance here of course is the idea of someone sticking needles into my brain um i think everyone has a, a reasonable fear of, of, of that sort of thing. Uh, but I also know my memory shit. And uh, uh, this this could be really neat. My, my concern here is this is just a few steps away from having a cell phone or whatever implanted in your brain and your boss calling you at three in the morning and waking you up because he shocked your brain and gone, no, I need you to come into the office. Shit has happened. <laughs> now, what, what, what this does is, um, specifically this implant is looking to help with people whose hippocampus is not performing at the task. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that 
actually encodes memory. I'm being very rough there, but that's generally what it does. It takes the impulses and, and the experiences we have and encodes them into your brain in terms of short-term or long-term memory. It's it's what it's what pretty much writes. Yeah, it, and it this, etches the record of your brain, shall we and say? And this 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 looks like it takes the signals that allow for the etching to take place and boost them. So it's sort of almost like a pacemaker for your memory. Right. Yeah. It's 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 for people whose hippocampus may be damaged or not functioning properly. This will allow a bit of a boost on that. Now, it's not actually the computer looking at the memories and going, hmm, what is this? I will do this job now. What it's it's just sort of augmenting the signals that are already in your brain because your brain is a big old storm to, of electricity. To help you write the memories. Right. Yeah. Kind of neat. But this is it's interesting that we're we're getting to this point. That this could start when we're talking about the signals in the brain and learning how to enhance those signals. Oh, I know who's gonna hate this though. What who? All those politicians who, when the scandal hits them, I they can't recall. Anything. You get your fucking brain implant, bitch. Yeah. No, sir. We know you have the brain implant. You, yeah. It was turned on. The, my other real concern with this is, given this plus the Internet of Things, this should not be Bluetooth cable or or wireless cable. It should. It should. It, no. Bad idea. Well, I don't know. Well, we're talking about enhancing signals. Yeah, but what about the first thing they're going to do and then they'll go, OK, we have got enhancing down. Now we're going to get read right. Well, I, I was thinking more along the lines of suppressing signals, because if they if they're understanding how to enhance certain signals in certain areas of the brain, they could extend that. Consider this as potentially depression treatment. Yeah, or or treatment for other mental disturbances or any other um anomalies in the brain because if they can enhance what if, if they're oh, i just thought the best use for this huh it can help you forget cold play <laughs> well wouldn't that but wouldn't that be interested instead of in enhancing cold play yes <laughs> instead of enhancing your memory you could also tell your brain this isn't very important i don't want to remember this you could prioritize your memory yeah. processes or you could, it's sort of like with your email, you could flag something as very important. You could do that with your, because all you have to do is increase the intensity, potentially. And pri you could prioritize your memories. Do, do, you, do you remember Real Genius? Yes. I noticed you stopped stuttering. I've been giving myself shock treatments. Up the voltage. Mm. <laughs> But it's it's. But yeah, this... no, I, I I agree. It's got a lot of potential, and it's got a lot of. Um, I think it also can has a lot of potential for very scary things. Yeah. So we'll have to see how it goes. But this this could be. And, but it is it is one further step along towards Shadowrun. Ugh, ugh, no. Because we're gonna make it Dude, stupid. I want cyber eyes so badly. My eyes are so screwed up. But it is it is an important if they get this functioning the way they want it to, if they get FDA approval, this could be considerable treatments for people who have Alzheimer's, for people who have other memory related True. issues, brain damage. This could be a significant step to us to further cybernetics. And that's fascinating to me. I just I love that. I think it's awesome. That's fucking awesome. If you don't agree, you're stupid. <laughs> All right. That's our news for this week. Now, um, next thing we want to talk about is, of course, questions. We're going to be looking at those now. Like I said at the top of the show, if you have questions for us, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. We will attempt to help you with those. And we got a bunch this week. Um, some of these are a little bit more than others, so I'm going to go through them as we can because some of these are, are fairly simple. Others of these are going to make you kind of want to go, fuck. All right. Um, let's start with the, uh, with the Vectra PC. Do you see that one, the HP? The Windows uh, 95 yes. system? Okay. Yeah, that one I think is pretty straightforward. 
Okay, this one comes from Jonathan. He says, my dad recently brought home an old Windows 95 HP Vectra PC. However, when it boots, it goes straight into the point of sale software that the store that discarded it used. Is there any way to get it back to the desktop so I can perform a factory reset? I would really like to use this to play and record some older games, included some photos to boot up an OS in case they help. Um, well, uh, oh, let me get that out of your, your I got, you got outlook on your face. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, there is a way to do this. I'm going to bring up these pictures here. Uh, oh, I didn't attach those. I'm sorry. Um, no, no worries. I, I, I can pretty much guess as to what's going on. It's got something in the startup section that is running automatically. Yeah. Now, uh, let, let me uh, break this down for folks who don't understand. When we say POS, we don't mean piece of shit. Although it is early HP, so... Yeah. What we're talking about is point of sale. These are those machines you see in, uh, well, in the checkout line at uh, your bank ATM. Those are what's considered a point of sale computer. I'll... Often made by a company called National Cash Register or NCR, but not always. Yeah. I'll... In the early days of point of sale, what they would do is they would take computers... Out pretty much the same ones they put in the stores and play, put them in place with specialized software on them. Um, and to keep, because it, of course it's the early days, people didn't necessarily know how to use computers very well. They would be built so that they would start up and just launch into the point of sale software. So there's no, yeah. no real need for training other than how to use the, this, this, the POS, the, the sales software. You didn't have to teach them how to turn on a computer, how to launch the software, how to do anything, just how to use this thing to ring stuff up. Now, what you need to do, Jonathan, to get this to work is um, the first thing, I believe, I'm not entirely sure if this will allow for it. The first thing you could try is Control-Alt-Delete and attempt to get it to reboot into safe mode. Uh, what this will come, yeah, yeah. What this will accomplish with safe mode is, you will be given the option instead of when the computer starts back up again in safe mode. Instead of running all those startup programs that put the point of sale software on your machine, it'll come up to a normal desktop instead. And there might be an option for you to say start things prompt by prompt. So it'll say, yeah. start, the, load this driver, load the, and it, it can be a pain to go through. Well, what you want to do with, with the safe mode, once you get to the desktop, you want to go to your start button, and, or did, did Windows run? Did Windows R work back then? I don't remember. Well, you want it's to, 95. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. Um, you want to attempt to run MS config. And what this will do is this will give you the selective startup option. You can uncheck programs from your startup, in which case, when if you uncheck the point of sale software, anything, pretty much what you want to do is uncheck anything that does not say it's been provided by Microsoft.com. That will or or that doesn't look like it might be like a video driver. Right. Right. Or things like that. Um, the other thing to check after you unchecked everything there is go to your start menu, go to all programs. I don't remember Windows 95 had in all programs are just defaulted there, but and look for a folder under all programs called startup mm -hmm. and see what's in there. If you see something in there that looks like point of sale software titles, mm -hmm. especially when you when the point of sale software launches, it probably has the name of the software across the top because it was 95 and everyone mm -hmm. did that. And so look for that name. And delete and, those shortcuts. And delete those shortcuts because anything in the startup file folder is automatically run when you re, uh, launch the computer. Right. And MS config will not necessarily uncheck those things because it goes to us. You should know it's in the startup folder. Right. So you want to do MS config in a selective startup. Uncheck everything that's not Microsoft or potentially a video driver or whatnot. You want to go into your startup folder and delete all the shortcuts in there because I, back then, anything you put in the startup folder was pretty much useless anyway. Um, that will get you to a more or less clean desktop, and you may, if 
the system does in fact have the uh, factory reset option, you should find it there. Now your other option, if that doesn't work, um, I'm looking at your, your startup screen now, and it looks like you can go into F2 to set up and tell it to, you're gonna need a Windows 95 CD, however. If you can find one, good luck. If you can make one, we ain't gonna say nothing. Um, but you'll need to find a Windows 95 CD. However, I've noticed you have a slight problem here, and I'll put this on screen so my, I'll read it for Mike so he'll understand what I'm talking about here. Um, the problem is this. It reads, uh, when it sp tries to find the CD-ROM, error, unable to detect a Tappy IDE CD-ROM drive. So that might be a problem in attempting to boot from the CD-ROM because it looks like the CD-ROM may be broken. Yeah, um, if you can find, well, finding a replacement CD-ROM for something that old might be a bit tricky. You're gonna have to eBay that shit. Cause mo modern CD and DVD ROMs use what's called a SATA interface. A yeah. serial ATA interface. Back then it was IDE. IDE. SATA is- the ribbon cable. Right, SATA is this little EB type lug. IDE is this big long ribbon. And it looks like that that drive may be damaged or might not even have one in the first place, which is weird, but I could see that in the point of sale machine. Yeah. Um, because, you know, that's one more thing that uh, the standard, you know, register jockey could screw up. Yeah. So it, it may be a case of you may have to go on eBay. You're going to be looking for an IDE CD-ROM. With cable. With cable. Yeah, and I only say that because if you if you get the new one and you go, oh, there's no cable here. If you have a fries, they might still have some of those cables. Uh, otherwise, they're again a little tricky to run down anymore because they're they're not used. They're obsolete. They're completely obsolete. And 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 one of the reasons they're obsolete, by the way, is not just because of the SATA cable, but because they took up so much space inside the computer, they affected airflow. Yeah, the, the those the ID. Not, ID not, 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 not you know, it's, it's a ribbon cable. It's really thin, but it's wide. So wide, blocking. yeah. And yeah, and also they just they weren't as fast. They weren't as good. So we've moved on to something better. So those are going to be your two concerns. Um, if if you once you do find a CD-ROM drive that does work, what you'll need to do is go to this screen here that you also gave us, the one that where it says Vectra. Hit F2 for setup and uh, tell it to boot from the CD-ROM drive, put in a Windows 95 CD, and pretty much start over from scratch. You'll have to set up to install Windows 95. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm looking at this error message for the uh, That says the device driver not loaded. So it might still have the drive, just no driver. Hmm. So That may can... work from the boot up, yeah. Yeah, so if you can figure out the, the model of the drive, too, the driver's probably still out there in the world somewhere. Now, the, the only problem with doing Windows 95 from scratch is trying to track down the Windows 95 drivers. Oh, yeah, those, for, are, those can be a pain. For all the hardware on this system. Now, you may be in luck if you could find an archive. If you have the exact model of HP Vectra this is, you may be in luck and be able to Google the, the model number, find Windows 95 drivers, and find the an archive with all of those drivers on it. We You didn't include model number, however, so we don't know. We just know it's a Vectra, but we know what model it is, but we don't know what model number it is. So you might have to look that up yourself. But you that there you go. There are two different ways. If you want to get this old thing working for the old classic games that you can't play on, on Windows. Um, actually, if I can speak, HP Support Center still has the drivers. You get the fuck out of here. For Windows 95, yep. Get the fuck out. Well, that'll be, easy. that'll be easy to find then. However, there's a disclaimer. These downloads are available for customers according to the terms of the HP software license agreement. So it may prompt you for a key of some sort. I'm not going to try to download yeah. these drivers. But there does look like, well, no, it looks like they can just be straight. Get the fuck out. Yeah, they can straight be downloaded. It's not prompting me for anything. Um, it says some may require things, but 
Um, there's even a USB drive. I didn't remember 95 had USB. I know, right? Yeah, th- probably USB 1. Wow. Yep. Wow. La- last updated, 22 April 1999. Wow. One one version, no previous versions. Oh. But, but yeah, just uh, uh, when you're if, if you're at the point where you're looking for drivers, um, uh, what I typed in was HP Vector Drivers Windows 95 in Google. Yep. And it was the first link. And all you've got to do is fill in in the drop down your language and your operating system. So 95 was on there. So is Windows 3, Windows 3.1, and Windows 3.1.1. So there you go, Jonathan. Oh, God. And OS 2 Warp. Wow. So there you go, Jonathan. Those are two different options for getting that old system up and running. If you uh, do, let us know. Give us some updates. Tell us how it works out for you. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, let's move uh, on to what? Go ahead. I say, and that's, that's a computer that you'll be able to run old games on without having to reset clock speeds in those games. I know. Oh, man. Um, let's, let's move on. This is to uh, Ian. He says, this is a quick, short one. Hey, Dash. Probably a weird, stupid question, but my HP laptop's trackpad has been crapping out very frequently recently. Any ideas, fixes? Um, other than trackpads are generally kind of junk, but um, I don't recall HP's being user repl- trackpads being user replaceable. Not really. Um, your your best option, if it if it goes completely or becomes so uh, intermittent that's unusable, uh, I would get. Uh, a mouse of your choice, probably wireless because you're on a laptop. I'm not really a fan of wireless mice in general, but hey. Um, and make sure you disable the trackpad and whatever software. So you're not sitting there accidentally brushing it with your thumb going, why the hell's my cursor jumping all over the place? Yeah. With, with uh, laptop trackpads, a lot of the time, the the device, the trackpad itself is built into the entire palm rest assembly on the laptop. It is possible to replace these. It is not fun nor easy to replace these. Um, if you feel comfortable taking your laptop apart, which you're going to have to do, you could potentially replace it. But it's going to mean taking the monitor off, unscrewing a whole bunch of tiny little screws that you need to keep track of. And it's also going to mean tracking down a replacement part, likely on eBay or someplace similar, so you'll have to get your make and model, find the replacement part, find a teardown manual that will tell you step by step which screws you should and should not unscrew. It's a great big pain in the ass. Trackpads, yeah. when they go bad, they're just ugh. Now, that said, depending on the model of the HP, it might be relatively modular and come right out. There are some, I'm looking at a video for one right now, on HP's support center site again, that shows how to replace a trackpad. It's not a short process, but it's not terribly complex. Yeah. You do end up removing a lot of components. Another, um, another thing to consider is how old is your trackpad? How old is your laptop? Because it might not be worth it to fuck with it. It might just be time a way to either get, like Mike said, get a wireless mouse in the meanwhile and wait until you can finally get a new one because it's just so damn old, it's not worth fixing. In any event, you yes, you can replace the trackpad. It's just not... An, I, I could do it for you, dude. You bring me all the parts, I'd do it, but I'm a long ways away. Um, if you try to get HP or a repair center to do it, you're looking at probably how much... How many hours would that take? Uh, I, an I'd hour say, or I'd two? An hour or two at most. Because it's, you know, if it's, if it's anything like the video I just looked at, uh, it's it's not terribly complex. I mean, it's really just, they, they did a few more steps. They, they did remove the battery, move the keyboard, do this, do this, take out the trackpad, put in the trackpad, you know. Yeah. Large disclaimers of, please do not damage this other ribbon here or you'll be screwed. Um, and then reassemble it. It looked like it's pretty straightforward. So depending on, but it also depends on how much they charge per hour, depending on where you go to. And the parts. The part might be stupid expensive. A lot of the OEM parts are ridiculously expensive because the only place you can get an OEM part is from the manufacturer. So they like to charge quite a bit for those parts, which also encourages you to, instead of going to get parts, to go ahead and upgrade your system. 
And I will note, um, now you don't mention this. I, I did, did he say if it was an older? He okay, doesn't. Tell those. Didn't say much. Okay, so um, uh, probably not still under warranty. If it were under warranty, I would say get them to replace it. Yeah. Uh, if it's not, or if it's got different warranties on different parts of the laptop, which some of them do, um, they'll say you void your warranty if you do user if you do a user repair, but that's not actually true. Every company tries to claim that it's not true. No. But um, I just go wireless mouse. But I, as a person, I can't stand trackpads. I mean, it, it was a neat idea, and but I, I the way I rest my hands on on a laptop keyboard, I'm forever going where the where the cursor go. <laughs> uh, let's do Ashley's here. Um, because it's 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 a bit related. You were we're talking about wireless mice and keyboards. Um, hi, Nash and Mike. I did what you said and updated my video driver for my desktop. Worked wonders so far. Try to do something similar on my laptop before I leave for school. I actually have another question that's host hopefully mostly unrelated to this issue since it's, go since it's been going on for quite some time. Whenever I'm gaming on my desktop and only on my desktop, the cursor will start jerking and moving intermittently at inconvenient times, and my keyboard will sometimes refuse to work entirely for a few minutes at a time. I have a wireless mouse and keyboard and a three-year-old HP 70074. Um, what do you think could be the problem? It doesn't happen a lot, but it's often enough that it can get tiresome. Okay, there's a, I think there's a line you left out. Uh, it says uh, that where they intermittently disconnect. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the keyboard does it happens with Sims more often, where they don't use much the keyboard much, mm -hmm. where other games the keyboard use is constant. It seldom happens. That sounds to me like a timeout issue. Where it's going, mm -hmm. I haven't received a signal from this device or this device, you know, because uh, with wireless mice and keyboard, what they have is they have something built in that says, I'm not being used, go to a low power mode so that I don't drain the battery nearly as fast. And so with Sims, it sounds like it's not waking up from that low power mode yeah. the way you want it to. You know, it should be. Depending is, on the wire, depending on what model of wireless mouse and keyboard you have, it may have settings for that. It may not. Not all of them do, depending on who you got it from. I think Logitech does a lot of the time, but not. Yeah. Um, for, first thing I would do is change your batteries. If your batteries are mm -hmm. any kind of old, they're they're going to get you some flakiness there. Uh, check for corrosion on the battery contacts as well. If they've been in there a while, it's possible there's a little bit going on, and that can cause them to not work uh but intermittently and or, or malfunction intermittently and you'll sit there and go you know, pick mess why aren't you working and that little bit of shaking will be enough for something to realign and now it works again and so that's why it happens like that another rare but also possible issue is interference oh yes this is one of the uh the nasty things about using wireless mice and keyboards um and a uh, wireless stuff in general all wireless devices in the United States, at least, are required by law to allow interference. They, they... Well, well, two things. They're required by law to not interfere with other things, mm -hmm. and they have to accept interference from other things. Sort of how these work together. It's, it's really, you look at it and go, well, if nothing's interfering with everything else, then why are they required to accept it? Interference comes from all sorts of things. You turn on your blender or your microwave, it's putting out RF interference. Mm -hmm. um, there was actually a, 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 a physics project where they thought they had detected some stuff, but it turns out it was the microwave. <laughs> they, they thought, oh, we're going to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> no, it's just some guy doing and, a burrito. And before anyone jumps and says they did that on, on um, um, Big Bang Theory, that's where Big Bang Theory got the idea. Yeah. People watch Big Bang Theory? Yeah. People who watch this show watch Big Bang Theory? I used to watch Big Bang Theory. Shame on you. Shame. 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 Anyway, so back Shame. To, uh, uh, you don't mention, of course, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't think to. Uh, is there anyone else in the house who is using wireless devices? Mm -hmm. um, if you're using the same model, this is where you can run to it really greatly. Uh, if people are using this, I'll go, oh, yeah, I, I love my wireless mice. It's this model. And, they, and your, your roommate goes out and buys the same model based on your recommendation. You're actually a little more likely to interfere because it's going to be in. This, they're going to have been built in the same frequency band. Mm. Now they should 
be synced so that they're ignoring each other. But that's not always the case. No. Um, one... uh, and by, by the way, the re- I, I don't personally like wireless keyboards. I'm fine with wireless mics. The reason I don't like wireless keyboards is because they're very easy to intercept information off of. Yeah. Because they don't often encrypt the data going from the keyboard. So someone who is nearby and sniffing could go, I now have their bank password. Another reason uh, to not use wireless, especially with gaming, I, I would kind of, even though I know it's not uh, easy to just go out and plunk down $50 to get a new mouse and keyboard, um, with gaming and stuff, you have a latency issue. Um, wireless keyboards and mice, the time it takes, with a wired keyboard and mice, the time it takes for you to press the button and the computer to recognize you for press, you press the button, that's called latency. With a wired keyboard, it's very low latency because it just goes across the wire, boom, you push the button. With wireless, there's a little bit of a lag time, tiny bit, microseconds of lag time. And where that lag time comes in from is the keyboard has to translate the uh, key you pressed into the signal it sends wirelessly. Mm -hmm. The wireless receiver has to translate that back into the signal that it sends to the rest of the computer to say they pressed an A or a B or a Q, or whatever. So I'm I'm kind of biased against those in the first place. But um, another little thing to try if the battery thing doesn't work, or and you check for another thing, most people just take the the receiver, the little thumb USB receiver, and plug it in the back of their PC, which is a ways away from their from their laptop and from their mouse and keyboard. Plug it into the nearest USB port. Yeah, if if you need to get an extension cable, I know this this is kind of goofy, but get an extension cable and bring it up onto your desk, or get like a little USB hub, which may increase latency, so be aware of that. But plug it into as close as you can get it to the mouse and keyboard because that will cut down on the the distance the signal has to travel and the potential for stuff to interfere with it from where it goes to to where it ends up. Yeah, um, because, uh, you know, enough, enough computer desks have little bits of metal in there that could be just, you know, the keyboard's not working and you shift it like, you know, an inch and now the, the, the transmitter and receiver have a direct, more direct line without uh, the, the metal railing for your slide out panel right. getting in the way. And suddenly you're getting better reception. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What were... Latency actually ties into one of these other questions here. You want to do that one? Kaz's? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hey, Nash and Mike, this is from Kaz. He says, I've been looking, or she says, I don't know. It's, it's kind of ambiguous. Um, I've been looking into building a new PC after suffering through a variety of problems with my current one, uh, especially now the GeForce 1000 line and the Skylake have been released, as well as DDR4 dropping in price. I was wondering if you could explain RAM CAS latency and clock speed, particularly how the two relate to a PC's overall performance. Well, if you're building a new computer, uh, odds are you're looking at uh, DDR4. Right. As you as you mentioned, um, CAS latency is how long it takes. The okay, so there's a memory controller that pans stuff back and forth to memory, mm-hmm. and the memory controller basically says this memory block is free. Cast latency is how long it takes the computer to go in here. Some stuff for it. Imagine RAM working like a great big clockwork machine. Okay? Cogs rolling around. They tick against each other in time. The, the latency is how long it takes one peg of that clock cog to click along to the next one. That more, that more or less, yeah, yeah, and where there's a free space and where there's not a free space, you know, how, how gears and when, and click when there's into a free each space, other. yeah, and when there's a free space, it goes, Hey, there's a free space, shove some stuff in here, and then that moves along, and then there's another free space. It all works together, kind of like cogs in a watch. Um, now, now what for oh. with with cast latency is one of those things that you kind of want to look, it's like golf, lower is better. Yes. Um, the the lower latency, which it means it's the less time the memory takes moving something from one place to the next. Latency, the, the higher the latency, the longer it takes. Now you'll notice some the faster memory for some weird reason. This is this is kind of the, uh, a faster stick of RAM will have higher latency than a slower stick of RAM. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is uh, most computer RAM is what's called synchronous. It's tied to 
the clock speed. So that 19 on your, your DDR4265 mm -hmm. is 19 cycles. Right. So while it's a higher number, the fact that that 4265 is such a faster uh, memory stick than, say, a 2800 right. means that 19 is actually less time than the 14 on the 2800. So when you're comparing uh, RAM for cast latency, you have to make sure you compare the same clock speed models across the line. Say yeah. if you have DDR4 uh, 2800, is that one? Of, I, I'm not kept yeah, up. Yeah, 2800, I'm looking at, I'm, okay. I'm actually looking at a chart on Wikipedia right now. All right. If you have a DDR4 2800 stick, and one of them has a lower cast latency than another DDR 2800, I would go with the one with the lower latency. Bearing in mind, um, there is, of course, a difference in, in, in the uh, name brand of, right. of memory as well. There's some uh, brands of memory that are better than others, but they, they trade off as going, yeah, we can't, we don't we don't feel comfortable saying we can get 14s consistently, but we get solid 15s, right, or something like that. So the other thing to uh, when you're buying memory, you really want to buy your memory as as one batch, or you know, ideally the same brand, the same clock speed, the same latency. Because if they're not yeah. the same clock speed and the same latency, you can have issues that can be really squirrely for someone else Blue to try to track down. Blue screens, uh, just random things where it's going. I'm not addressing all the memory because it's none of it's lining up. You want it, yeah. You want all your RAM to match. So if you're getting DDR 3200s, you want to make sure all your memory is DDR 3200s. And if it's all DDR 3200, and you get 14 late, uh, 14 cast latency, make sure all of it's 14s. Yeah. So those are the two things to remember. Make sure you get them all the same kinds of RAM sticks, okay? If you're getting up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, then make sure you get them all, all those sticks of RAM are uh, the same brand, same make, same model. Because that, that, and the reason we say same brand is not because we, we necessarily go, oh, this brand is better than others, although I'm sure Nash and I have our favorites. Yeah. Um, it's because if everything is matching, then it's one less thing that is almost guaranteed to be an issue. Yeah. And the other thing is when you're looking at cast latency, when you're purchasing RAM, make sure you're comparing the same clock speed and not just saying, well, this one's got a low cast latency. Yeah, it might have a lower cast latency, but it also might be a slower stick of RAM as well. So you might be shortchanging yourself. Clock speed is more important than cast latency. Yeah, so let me, let me give an example of this real quick. Uh, DDR2666, uh, mm -hmm. one of the latency options is 15, and that has an 11.25 nanosecond response time, per this chart I'm looking at on, on Wikipedia. And uh, DDR4-3000 also has a latency of 15, whereas the other one was 11 and a quarter nanoseconds, this one is 10 nanoseconds. So you can see there's a difference, and that it, what that difference is, is the difference between the 2600 and the 3000, the clock speeds are uh, 1333 and 1500. So, so many clocks, 10, 15 clocks is 10 nanoseconds effectively. Yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. The, 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 the clock speed affects speed way more than latency does, but latency does affect it. Yeah. So, you, you, you want to get the, what you want to do is get the highest clock speed you can with the lowest latency you can. But make sure you're comparing the same clock speed when you're comparing latency across different models. Yep. Okay, well, I think that's going to pretty... Uh, and Kaz, let us know how it goes. In fact, everybody who we've, we've sent questions, if we answer your question, give us a write back. Let us know how it goes. If you have yeah. new questions, send those to us at request at radio.air.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line, but that's going to wrap it up for us. We'll be back in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Mike, as always, thank you very much. No problem. And, uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody.